Welcome to the Mad Singers Management Podcast from madsingers.com, where entrepreneurs and business managers learn and share. If you like the show, don't forget to leave a review. Hello, and welcome to this next episode of the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Today, we have the man himself, Noel Andrews. Welcome to the show. Hey, Mads. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. You're very welcome, and it's really a pleasure to have you here. Noel, just to kick off, for those of you, uh, those of the audience that don't know you, would you mind giving us a, a half brief introduction to who you are and what you do and why you're amazing? <laughs> yeah, no worries. So uh, I am the CEO and the owner of JobRack, uh, jobrack.eu, which is an online job board for awesome Eastern European workers. Um, I've got a background in kind of lots of core, kind of corporate IT leadership roles, and I still do some consulting in that uh, in that space um, with teams kind of typically up to kind of 50 or 60 people. So lots and lots of experience on the, on the management side there too. Um, and then kind of over the past kind of probably five, seven years or so, uh, similar to many people kind of read the four hour work week, uh, eyes opened to a, another way uh, that kind of uh, helped to guide some of the entrepreneurial spirit that I've had for, for a long time. And that got me kind of focused on the kind of the remote hiring world, um, kind of online businesses and, and into a great community that, uh, that we're both part of uh, in, the, in the Dynamite Circle. So, um, yeah, so I bought JobRack, uh, where are we, just last autumn. Um, I was looking for something that could really scale and had some real kind of good opportunity and it fit really well with a lot of the work that I'd been doing around kind of consulting and helping online businesses and business owners to kind of effectively hire, manage their teams and uh, kind of avoid some of the pitfalls that uh, when uh, whenever you come into anything to do with people that can uh, often happen. Awesome. Awesome. And why, why particularly should people use JobRec? Like what does it do so much better than all the other services? Yeah, no worries. So quite simply, it's the people we've got. So uh, for anyone not familiar with Eastern Europe, it is um, the single kind of best worldwide kind of combination of amazing people with truly kind of just a, an unbelievable work ethic um, at an amazing value. Uh, so uh, we've got uh, there's some kind of posts that we're part of where kind of people are talking about like kind of five dollar an hour tasks um, and what they can get done. And, and some of the things are absolutely amazing. So JobRack is 100% focused on Eastern European remote workers. Um, so there's lots of kind of uh, generic sites out there um, that kind of you can get great people from all over the world. But uh, we've got a we're very, very big fans and our customers are very, very big fans of, of kind of what you get with uh, kind of the Eastern Europeans. So like I mentioned, that kind of cultural alignment, a lot more closely aligned to kind of Western culture than um, maybe some of the people from kind of the Asia um, and other areas of the world like that. Um, and uh, again, that value piece, you know, it's, uh, you can just get incredible people that uh, really, really want to make a difference to your business and want to learn and grow, um, but still, at, you know, kind of great, great value. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So um, obviously the, the, the key thing here and, and what I want to dig in a little bit with you is, is a lot about recruitment as well, right? But uh, I, I have a few questions that I tend to ask all of my uh, interviewees and the first one for me is is really if you can tell me a little bit about your your management philosophy or really your mindset around management like how how do you think about management in itself yeah no worries so for me it's all about spending time and listening as well um the, whether it's the corporate world, whether it's that you've got remote workers or freelancers, it's all about being clear on what you want um, and what you need and communicating clearly and then making sure you're listening to the kind of the feedback you get. So, you know, there, whether there are, you know, kind of individual tasks, you might be paying someone 20 bucks to do something from Upwork, maybe or Fiverr right the way through to someone that you might be paying, you know, thousands of dollars a month for, for, a, for a senior team member. Um, ultimately we're all people uh, and you've got to kind of just got to focus on that and make sure you give them the right amount of time. Um, I see a lot of examples where kind of business owners will hire someone and then because they're remote or maybe because they don't think about it, they don't put that kind of that effort in up front to kind of establish like ways of workings and things that they want them to do and things that they don't want them to do, you know, right from saying good morning on Slack when they start work and things like that. And it, it can sound silly, but those kind of just small things just about really does make the difference. The same as if you were in an office together, just, you know, kind of saying hello as you pass them in, uh, as you come in in the morning. So for me, it's that, it's that communication piece and making sure you're being clear with what you want 
and figuring that out first um, and then listening to people. Excellent. That sounds exactly like what I teach. So that's, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I hundred percent. I mean, obviously I run an outsourcing company in Philippines and, and I see this the exact same challenge, right? Like the, the majority of reasons why people fail with VAs, it's, it's really down to the actual VAs. It's much more about how they're being managed. Right. And uh, yeah, the, it, exactly down to the point that you just pointed out. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's just people not being, Kind of uh, a lot of people jump into hiring a little bit too quick without being clear on what they actually want the person to do. And yeah. that just causes kind of frustration all around. Yeah. And actually what I see is they, they do it too late. So they do it when they're already, you know, working a hundred hours a week and yeah. they're way over burden and they don't actually have the time to actually train the people properly. And, you know, particularly the first couple of hires, it's very, very critical to, to get them into the business well, because again, if you fail, like it's expensive, it takes a lot of time and it's not something that's easy to just reverse. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's very, it can be very, very painful. So uh, yeah, that kind of upfront time is that's where it really makes the difference. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. And um, next, what do you sort of enjoy the most about managing people? And what do you sort of personally like the most with the sort of people management role however many staff you normally manage the so that the biggest kind of uh it's an interesting one for me it's probably when things happen without your involvement so very very hands-on and, and have been for for many years and if you want to scale and if you want to you know really push your business forwards you've got to let go and you've got to get help and get help from other people to do it so for me, that, that biggest kind of uh, satisfaction from people is when they do a really good piece of work um, and you read it and you just think, oh, that's great. That's really, really good. Or they deliver something or things become autonomous or, and, and crucially, I mean, one of the really amazing ones is when they are making things better for your business off their own back without being, you know, specifically told exactly what to do. Um, that kind of that satisfaction and when they're enjoying it as well, because that's, you know, that, that's even better. You know, if you've got like a, a real kind of rock star that's uh, you know working really hard but is really enjoying what they do um and i'm very lucky and uh, one of the guys that works for me um if a guy called vladan so quick shout out to vlad um he you know he's absolutely rock star but he loves what he's doing um and he's thrilled to have that kind of remote opportunity and to be working in that way so that's i think just seeing them having a great time doing this work and, and kind of getting results for, for you and your business yeah yeah totally agree that makes a ton of sense makes a ton of sense so um one of the things that that a lot of people struggle with and i want to ask you this very specifically because i know this is one of your pet peeves so which is really about onboarding of people so what what sort of your approach when you're bringing in new people to the business when you're recruiting new people like what what's your sort of onboarding strategy and how do you go around that whole aspect yeah, sure. So it, it starts way before the onboarding and it starts when I'm thinking about what's the role that I want to hire. And I always start off thinking, what are the outputs that I want? What do I actually want them to deliver? Um, the vast majority of job descriptions that we see, whether the corporate world or the online hiring world are, are pretty terrible. Um, and when you make it in terms of the outputs that you want them to do, things get a lot, lot clearer. So for me, the onboarding starts there, starts way before in terms of saying, right, what is it I want to do? <clears throat> excuse me, then when someone starts, mm -hmm. I will typically have kind of we, um, daily calls with them, um, bring them up to speed, making sure that they've, we give them a blend of tasks in terms of them getting their understanding up and learning about job rack and our processes and, you know, what we want them to do. Um, but also very quickly giving them specific things to do that they can do and, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, learn kind of as they go. Um, but the key one is just giving them time. So typically in the first few days, it might be an hour a day. Um, and that is split roughly 50-50 between talking about the tasks and the business and 50% getting to know them um, as a person. Because that's, you know, when you're communicating with people, it's hard enough doing it face to face. When you're doing it across, <clears throat> you know, Slack, Skype, all the various different channels that we have these days. Um, and especially with Eastern Europe, uh, Europeans, because they are pretty direct, um, which for a Westerner can take a little bit of getting used to. Um, yeah. It's fantastic when you get used to it, but it does take some getting used to because they'll just tell you how it is. Um, whereas our kind of Western sensitivities, you know, in the kind of UK, US, Australia, et cetera, um, we're sometimes not used to that quite so much. So key thing is just invest the time. If you had someone working in your office or if you do have someone starting in your, in your actual office, you're going to be spending time with them. 
um, and not just sitting down about the tasks. It is, it's about getting to know them. So for me, yeah, daily calls, they tend to drop off after a few weeks and we make sure that we um, kind of have, give, have given them lots of work to do. Yeah. Um, and then dropping down to typically kind of a couple of calls a week. Um, and I think I'm now at the point where we do like a, a work-based one-to-one every week. And then we do a kind of just having a chat, getting to know each other more, talking about what we're doing at the weekend on probably a fortnightly basis. Yeah. Okay. That sounds cool. That sounds cool. And, and yeah, I, t- I totally agree with the onboarding piece, right? That's, uh, I mean, a, a couple of key aspects is most entrepreneurs know their business really damn well. Now, the problem is that doesn't mean a brand new employee do that. And a lot of the time, I see a huge mismatch in the expectations between what someone brand new to a company can know and understand. Uh, and, and a lot of the time, you know, it, it's so easy to think, oh, well, I understand this thing, so other people must do it too, and, and kind of fail to to close that gap for people and particularly brand new people into an organization, right? It's really so critical to spend the time talking with them, explaining things. And like one of the things I love doing in the beginning is getting people to make mistakes, not on purpose, but actually getting them to, I like pushing people into big challenges initially that, you know, where, where they sometimes make mistakes. And I really love showing them that that's totally okay. Because I, I, I often have the feeling that, uh, you know, everyone says, oh, it's okay to fail, but they don't really mean it. Whereas I feel if you show people initially that, uh, like, give them big challenges and, and stuff where they actually end up making some mistakes and, and you know, they, they start realizing that's okay. That's one of the ways I've personally found that's really effective to actually help build that culture of, you know, failing isn't the end of the world kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. And it also makes it very clear that you're not expecting them to be perfect. Um, exactly. and that then helps with the communication and just being able to talk about things and saying, okay, well, you know, that happened. So how could we do that better? What can we learn? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, okay. That, that's great. No, um, next up, I mean, you do a lot of recruitment, right? Um, and, and I mean, we, we can talk Eastern European specific or we can talk more general, but what, what do you feel is the sort of number one, two mistakes that you generally see people make in the recruitment process? Hmm. Yeah, so number one is not allocating enough time for it, I think. Um, and then number two is not being clear on what they really want. So I have and I help uh, entrepreneurs and business owners quite regularly having that kind of initial call where we're just chatting through. And, you know, I had one guy guy quite recently and he literally wasn't sure whether he needed a VA or a CEO. Um, And because of what he was going through in his head and where his business was at, which that was the the extreme of uh, uncertainty. Um, But I think that's, yeah, number one, it, it takes time to do a good job. You know, people talk about kind of hire slow, fire fast, uh, which is a bit crude, but you've got to put the time into, um, you know, getting the right person for your business. Um, They're going to make a huge difference to you. So, you know, as I when I advertised for one of my more recent roles um, in the job ad, you know, I was very, very clear that, you know, I was going to pay them. 10, I think it was about between 15 and $20,000 over the next 12 months. Therefore, I expected some, you know, a bit of time invested on their side in their application. Um, And I think when you put it in that perspective, in terms of an investment decision of, you know, whatever that salary is going to be over the next 12 months, and hopefully longer than 12 months, um, that helps to kind of uh, justify the time that you're going to need to spend on it. Um, so that's a big one, just making sure you have the time to do it. Um, and if you don't, then there's services out there and, you know, we can help with that. And many others can that give you a bit more guidance and actually handhold you through that process, uh, kind of like a done for you type service uh, where you kind of we take a lot of the, the kind of the pain away um, in that regard. But yeah, I think that's definitely one of the two key ones for me is, uh, yeah, kind of having enough time to do it and making sure you know what you want. Okay. That's uh, great options. Um now, next, and this is a little bit of a challenging one, but what, what is the biggest challenge that you, uh, in job rec specifically, what's the biggest challenge that you have faced and overcome? And how did you go about doing it? Yeah, sure. So biggest challenge was actually my deciding to do the first hire. Um, so I bought the business and it was very, very, very lean. Um, so there were, no, there were a couple of freelancers associated with it. Um, and I have built, kind of online platforms, relatively small ones, but I've built online systems from scratch before. And 
you understand everything because you've done it. Uh, whereas buying something is completely different. You, I'll never have a 100% understanding of all the kind of nuts and bolts that are behind the scenes of, of the kind of the technology platform. Yeah. Um, so taking on that lean business and especially it was, you know, it was a very, very, it has a great brand and a great reach, but it hadn't been focused on. It was kind of a bit of a part-time um, kind of focus for, for the guys that I bought it from originally. And they did some great, great work with it, but had a bigger a bigger project that they were more focused on. Yep. So the biggest challenge that I had was figuring out, right, what is the right role for me to hire um, and deciding what I really wanted and then kind of pushing myself to do that. And I did take time. I took about three or four months after I actually bought the business yep. to make sure I was clear on actually what were the priorities and, and what were the right things to look for. Um, and yeah, you know, I spent time hiring, made it very, very clear that I was, you know, expecting a lot, but in return it was, you know, um, you got to make sure that you sell the opportunity. You know, the days of just throwing up any rough job description or job post and just expecting to have hundreds of people just throw themselves at your feet because they're thrilled and excited to have your kind of five bucks an hour. Um, that can still happen. Actually, the if you want the really best people, they're a lot more astute now um, and they're, they're really good people. So you've got to attract them. So you have to sell your opportunity uh, to them. Uh, and that was something I focused uh, focused a lot of time on to get the right the right person in. That I, I love that. I mean, that's uh, one of the things I tell my coaching clients is very much the same. When you interview, when you hire, it's not just about you sort of looking at uh, who wants to work here, but you need to sell the opportunity because the the thing is, like, you're not Google and you're not Facebook, right? Uh, if, if you are those companies, you probably don't need to sell your opportunity so much. But when you are a small company, like you want people who really want to work for you, not just who want to work, but you really want to find people who want to work for you, right? And, and get eager and get passionate about that role. And the way you do that is by selling that role, selling that job really damn well, right? And it's not a question of like, oh, well, we pay the highest salary, we you have the most privileges, you don't have to do anything, whatever. Like it's not that kind of sales, but the best people want big challenges and big responsibility, right? And it's really the ability to sell that job you have is so critical for getting the right people. So that's, uh, yeah, I totally love that one. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's, they've, there's got to be room for them to develop, you know, whether that's yeah. kind of training courses, whether that's more opportunities, they've got to be able to see that there is a path for them to grow. Um, so my guy that I took on and he, he joined as a marketing and hiring assistant. And, you know, when I talked about, you know, I often ask people, uh, and I picked it up from, uh, from another site online, you know, kind of what three promises would you want me to make? Um, you know, when you're interviewing someone, um, I'm not even sure Mads, that whether that was one of yours, actually, I'm trying to think back where I, where I came from, but it, I love it. And this guy just said to me, he sees his future as, you know, being the kind of marketing director of job rack. Um, and that was where he was at that. You know, that's what he's looking for and he wants that opportunity to grow so making sure that yes you give good benefits and you know you're a good boss to work for and opportunities but finding ways to help them grow because if you do that then that's going to help your business kind of tenfold yeah and, and the, the one way i normally look at it is if salary is the biggest obstacle or the biggest reason for them to join then you're doing something wrong because then if someone else comes along with a little higher salary they're gone and they you don't want yeah. you don't want to invest in people who disappears like that, right? No. So okay, it's super interesting, super interesting. So, how do you like when when you're doing interview with people and so on? How 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 do you really identify who's the right fit for you? Yeah, it's difficult. Interviewing is hard, and. Um... Thankfully, I have a lot of experience and I had one of my previous businesses was actually doing interview coaching. So helping candidates prepare for interviews because it's not something that we're taught. And typically it's a you know, nerve wracking experience. So um, it's something that I focus on a lot. I think very carefully about what is it that I'm going to look for them to do and how can I validate that they can do that and that, um, you know, that they'll work in kind of the ways of working that kind of are aligned to kind of our culture and, and the, our kind of focus. Um, the key thing is scenario questions for me. So I will not only ask them what, give me examples of when you have done something, but I'll focus on just talk me through how you would do this. Because actually it's much harder for a candidate to uh, be creative. Um, you know, if they were to try and embellish the truth a little bit, it's a lot harder when you're asking them how would they do something. Um, 
So I'm a big fan of getting them to talk through. And I just want to see their, their kind of thought process. How are they going to approach this task? Um, and then back that up with evidence of when they have actually done it and always take references, you know, validate what they're saying um, by kind of confirming it with, uh, you know, one or two people they've previously worked for. But again, just try and make, you know, interviews should not be interrogations. Yeah. That's not an effective way to, uh, to get to really find out whether a candidate's the right one for you and your business. So prepare for it is number one. Um, and then just really kind of focus on what have they done and what do they want to be doing? And just, again, it's like you said there, get into their motivations. What are they motivated by? Because if it's salary and only salary, that's, that's not going to hit the spot for you. Um, what are they really interested in and, and kind of what's going to kind of tick the box for them? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah. One, one thing that a lot of the guys I work with and, and a lot of the clients we have, they, they're sort of looking for is really what, what's the best way when you hire staff, how do you really identify who, who are the ones that's going to take the next step up? Like who's tomorrow's leaders? Do you have any kind of process around that? Or how, how do you normally personally try and figure out who, who the right leaders is in the future for your company from, from within? Yeah, that's a, that is tricky. I don't have a kind of a clear process for it. Um, a lot of that comes a lot more through gut feel and you, and then if you would, if I was to try and distill that down to what is it I'm kind of feeling about it, it's attitude ultimately. Um, and I will typically hire for attitude. Yes, I've got to make sure they can do the job, but I can teach technical skills and process skills a lot easier. And, you know, there's an argument that says you can't teach attitude and to be the kind of person that you want to be working with, um, you know, inquisitive and kind of, uh, kind of committed and, and just wanting to do a really great job. So I think in terms of that kind of leadership piece, it's looking at their approach to specific tasks. It's looking at, you know, what do they want to be doing and how do they deal with people? Whether it's, you know, how do they deal with you as the, as the owner or the or kind of the manager uh, or how are they kind of dealing with their peers? And just, you can tend to see it. You can tend to see people that are getting the best out of the other people around them. Um, and then it's just about giving them support and opportunities to, kind of make more of that whether that's you know taking the lead on a particular project whether that's um you know taking the lead on a small team but again always just make sure you're giving them that that support but it's it's really it's kind of attitude um and also i mean the thing that you mustn't do and we see this in the corporate world all the time where people get promoted um you know beyond the point of competence so just because i'll, I'll use the example of a developer um, just because a developer is really, really great and is an amazing developer does not mean that he should become the development team lead or she. That That's not necessarily the right kind of step up for them. But often managers and business uh, businesses will look and say, well, how can I progress these people? And they end up putting the, the kind of the wrong people into the jobs just because it's a right. We can progress and promote them that way. It doesn't mean it's the right thing. So you've got to you've got to understand for each person what's the right progression path for them. Yeah. And I. I... I have a little bit of interesting view on that one because what, what I see consistently is it's not just that you promote necessarily the, the not right people, but it's the fact that you promote them and then just expect them to be able to do everything without any support. Yeah. Whereas, you, you know, like these developers, like people would buy them courses and help them grow in development. Then they would promote them to a development manager and then they'll do nothing to actually support their management growth, right? And that's where I actually see the biggest lack. And, and, I, and I see it clearly with my course, right? So many of our clients that, that get my management course, like they're, they're like, it's actually the staff very often that end up benefiting from it the most because they've had zero training. They've had zero investment in this new role, right? So they've been taking on this new responsibility, but no support from actually doing it. And, and that's one of the like, biggest flaws I really see out there, right? Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's like you're bringing a new member of staff in. Okay, great that they already know the company, but you need to onboard them again exactly. into that job that they've now got. And yeah, so, so many people forget that and then wonder why three or six months later they're frustrated because they're not working and doing the things they want them to do. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things that we really focus a lot on, right, is really making sure that not just if people are promoted, they, they get the support, but really making sure as well that um, that it's clear to them that we believe in them, 
right? Because a lot of the time I, I see, I've seen so many, like particularly when I work corporate, so many people just sitting back with this feeling of empty, right? Like, oh yeah, I was promoter. I got the job. I'm super happy. And what now? Right. So like, as you said, that clear expectation setting and so on, it's just, it's so crucial for, for making it work well. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. So the next one is, is one of my favorite questions. So how, how do you get managers working for you to perform well? So when you've worked with managers who, who have had staff of their own or had t- teams, even small teams of their own, what, what do you do to make sure they do a great job and that they are effective? Yeah, so there's a couple of things here. So one is um, give them space okay, and let them manage. Um, so often when I've been in a variety of roles kind of with people in, you know, uh, in physical proximity, so in an office as opposed to being remote, mm-hmm. um, but it's still true for remote, give them that space so that you're not, you know, um, on top of their team, if you like. So you've got to give them the space to actually manage their team and do, do the job you're asking them to do. Um, spend time with them and make sure that they've got the skills to actually lead and, and to manage a team um, and spend time just talking about it. You know, how's it going? You know, and make just, I guess it's just checking in with them and seeing how are they finding managing the team? Are they close enough? Are they investing that time in the team to understand where they're at, both from a work and from a personal perspective? Um, and I think the key is just, you know, you've got to shift the conversations, your, your one-to-ones with your, your manager um, that's now leading that team of people have got to shift from being a lot less task focused and being kind of more people focused. Um, because ultimately they are then guiding and leading and enabling that team of people who are all contributing and driving your business. Um, so I think it's just making sure you're giving them the time and the support like, uh, like we talked about. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Um, what, what do you consider to be unique about your management style compared to other people you see out there? I am brutally, brutally honest. Um, and it's both a strength and it's a weakness. And I continually work to moderate it and soften it. Um, but I tend to, there's, there's often times when I'm first working with people that I will introduce myself and I will talk them through. I'll say, hey, look, you know, I can be really, really straight talking, blunt almost, um, but I can take it in reverse as well. Um, and I think that is, in my experience, is pretty unusual. Um, just having someone that's willing to just be straight with someone. And it, it's not, I'm not rude with people by any means, um, but it is just being honest and giving them feedback that they can actually use to, to grow. So uh, I'm a big, a big, big fan of the aid model of feedback. So, you know, we are typically pretty terrible um, managers in general at giving feedback. And we, you know, we might say, this is what you did, but we won't talk about, you know, what was the result of that or what we wanted to do differently. We just kind of like, don't do it again. And so the aid model is something that I've used for years and it's basically action, impact and do. And so when you sit down with someone, you kind of say to them, well, look, this is the thing that you did. This is the action that you did. Crucially, the impact of that was, you know, so you know, let's say it's someone coming in and they've been a bit short, they're having a bad morning, for instance, kind of thing, you know, and it might be, look, you came in, you were in a pretty bad mood kind of thing, and, and you were a bit curt with someone. The impact of that was it affected the mood in the office and actually, or on Slack even, whatever it might be, but that impact is crucial um, because then that helps them to realize that it wasn't them just being a bit grumpy and I'm, I'm just using a, a lighthearted example. Um, it had an actual real impact on other people. Um, and that could be that they've made a mistake and that cost you money or they've, you know, um, frustrated a customer whatever it might be and then the third piece is do which is where you tell them what you want them to do differently uh, in the future and so I'm a, I'm a kind of a big big fan of um, yeah just giving people just being really straight with people and helping them to to develop through yep. you know, good feedback both developmental and and complementary yep that makes a ton of sense makes a ton of sense and um, yeah and, and I, I guess you have a little bit of eastern European blood in you then <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think um, I've got some really good friends actually from Eastern Europe that I've had since, you know, long before I came across kind of job rack. Um, and it's now in my plan to, I want to spend a lot more time out there. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating area of the world. And, you know, just talking to Vlad, the guy that works for me, um, about like some of the, the crazy challenges that they've had in such a short period of time. You know, they've had some, you know, crazy, crazy levels of war and kind of challenges within their companies, uh, country, sorry. Um, 
and yet they're these you know amazingly positive people that you know achieve so much so you know they've they've gone through uh, a very accelerated challenging period over this last kind of i guess 20 years in many of the many of the countries out in that area of the world but um they're just yeah just amazing people and amazing places to uh, to be and get out there so and that that's on you know we all talk about remote workers and having remote teams which is fantastic it's got huge benefits um but getting face time and getting together um you know once twice a year whatever that turns out to be is is hugely hugely important so that's that's something we're working on at the moment yeah totally totally agree with that now next one we we are all not perfect for sure so What's one of the key things within job right that you're looking to improve right now? What's one of the things you feel is not going so well and that really needs some focus to be improved? Definitely, without any doubt, is our marketing. So we have um, a, an amazing database of really, really great job seekers. Um, we've got a you know small to medium sized kind of uh, collection of customers that work with us pretty regularly and have hired multiple times from us. Um, but expanding out of that and getting that message about Eastern Europe out there is, is definitely the biggest challenge. Um, and it's something that particularly is a challenge for me because marketing and that kind of that creative kind of thought process isn't, isn't my natural skill set. Um, and so that's part of the reason of bringing people on board and continuously looking and saying, what skills do I need to bring in to help help to accelerate this? Um, but yeah, with that, without doubt, the, the marketing side, there's huge opportunity. You know, there's there's such an amazing growth of online businesses and they're kind of finding the, or kind of becoming enlightened into the kind of world of online remote workers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, like you said, with kind of with your work with the Philippines and, and Eastern Europe, that the opportunities to get such a huge competitive advantage are just awesome. Um, and it's just a case of kind of educating people and helping people to figure out and saying, right, you know, you're recruiting for that role you should look in this area of the world because there's an absolute wealth of people. Um, you know, you're recruiting for a different role that that's, you might want a, you know, native Westerner, for instance, from someone from the U S UK, Australia, et cetera. Um, and it's just working with people. And so just kind of spreading the, um, the, the Eastern Europe message. Yeah. And that, that, that's one of the things I really love. Right. So, so in our business and generally when I recruit, like, I'm very, very keen on looking at where do you get not just the best bang for buck, but where, like when I hire developers, and as an example, I, I love hiring them in Eastern Europe because I think they're uh, the, the Asian, like the Asian developers, uh, from, from my experience, generally lacks some of that. Uh, understanding is probably the right thing, right? So like developers are higher in specific regions. Um, writers, for example, we hire a ton of writers and sort of creative writers in, in, in the African regions because you have a fair few countries there that have like native or very, very good natural English, right? Whereas again, a lot of time, if you're working with Filipinos or Indians or very often when you get content from people like that, it it have like words are not uh, sentences are not always put together in a native English way that you would get in Africa, right? So so really looking at where where do we get the best pieces of work? Uh, generally, from like with the world being such a global place, right? And and so so many available opportunities, like for a business, that's really amazing to be able to do that. And it really gives you significant flexibility, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's like you said before, it's one region of the world isn't right for everything. Um, yeah. you, know, you can go to any region of the world and you can hire pretty much any role, um, but it's then figuring out what's right for, for your business. And we definitely have some specialities. Um, and it's quite interesting, you know, so Serbia is a huge like hotbed of social media people um, and writers and content writers, especially. Um, and you get some really, really good ones, but you're absolutely right that that lack of true native English, um, just you have to add that just extra step of kind of a little bit of editing. Um, but really interesting that you said about the kind of uh, the African side of things. I hadn't, I hadn't kind of come across that. So I'll definitely, definitely take a look into that because that's really interesting. I mean, if, if you look at like South Africa, for example, right? Uh, I, I have a ton of people who only spoke English their entire life. And if you look at the salary cost and so on in South Africa, uh, I can tell you that they're, they're, they're Eastern European-ish. Like a, a lot of people, I, I think minimum wage is like two bucks an hour or something in South Africa. Right. So, 
um, again, there's people making a lot more, but but just from a from a competitive advantage again, it, it's 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 really interesting market, and and there is other countries like not just South Africa, but but uh, Kenya and Nigeria, we we look a lot at as well, uh, just because of sort of the the value for money you get, and and um, for for some of the stuff we do, it's not always worth it. We we don't always have the ROI in hiring like Native Americans and Native. British people or whatever to to do the content writing so we, we, we really enjoy sort of looking at those different aspects and uh, yeah really getting the best people in the best places yeah no, that's interesting and certainly from what I see here in the UK um, a lot of organizations have got call centers outsourced to South Africa because again the kind of the time zone is complementary and you get the um, the native English um, that you don't get in in a lot of other kind of areas of the world so uh, yeah really interesting yeah okay that's awesome. Um, what do you consider being the biggest business risk that you have right now? And how are you trying to mitigate that risk? If you are. Yeah, I think um, biggest risk. I think there's, there's maybe two. Um, one probably key risk and one's a, a challenge and you know we almost touched on it a moment ago so the probably biggest risk is that historically a huge portion of our customers um, and businesses that have worked with us have come through a kind of a private network a private community um, and so that's the the reliance on that historically as a source of customers um, is a pretty significant risk. Um, they're not likely to go anywhere. They're, they're all, you know, huge, vast majority, are hugely happy with, with job rack and come back again and again. Um, but it comes back to that biggest challenge I've got is that piece around, um, uh, you know, expanding and marketing and kind of breaking out of that. So that's probably one piece. And the other one is actually, it's quite difficult to talk about the benefits of, Eastern Europe and one particular region of the world, whether it's Philippines, Eastern Europe, wherever it might be. Um, and when you talk to people about it, like you said, you know, you've had experience with developers from certain regions of the world that just didn't hit the spot for you. And whether that was uh, cultural, whether that was technical, whatever it might be, it can be pretty difficult to actually talk about those things and without kind of coming across as, I'll be really blunt, kind of racist. And certainly some of the copy on job rack when I first acquired the business was definitely on the other side of the kind of line of acceptability. And it's really tricky because it's people's experiences. And lots of people have had, you know, frustrating experiences with certain areas of the world where they just don't get the reliability or they don't get the commitment. But equally, there's thousands and millions of amazing people in, in every area of the world. So it's that's a real kind of balance to be had around, you know, making sure we're kind of telling a story that people can relate to. Um, in a positive, proactive way, but doing it in such a way that, you know, you're kind of focusing on the benefits, but yeah, not kind of getting into that, you know, stereotype, stereotyping of kind of particular regions of the world, which it's, it's very easy to do and can be quite tricky to write content that kind of people can relate to with their experiences, but without kind of, um, yeah, being offensive. Yeah. And uh, I mean, actually one of the biggest biggest surprises I have when I first moved to the Philippines was um, like the local job boards, right? Like it would literally say, we are looking for young woman, 18 to 22, uh, include a picture, right? Like that was literally like the application forms <laughs> and so on. And I was like coming from Europe, that's like, whoa. <laughs> that was, and, and now we are talking like the biggest supermarket chains in the world. like. If you want to be a cashier, you have to be a woman between the age of 18 and, I don't know, 25 or something. And to apply, you basically need to include a picture of yourself. Uh, and, and that was like, for, for me, that was like, that was stepping over the border, right? Uh, yeah. Sort of the limits that, that we are naturally used to. Um, but, but that's really interesting. And it's a great point, right? Because I, I think, again, in, in different cultures, these things are viewed very differently. Because when I was like, like I nearly fell off my chair or my horse or whatever. Uh, but, but you, you know, for the locals, that's like, oh, yeah, that's normal because they want beautiful people to be doing these jobs. And I'm like, yeah, but, <laughs> you, you know, for, it's just a totally different culture. And, and when recruiting, like that, that's one of the key things I've learned is actually look at native job posts. So even when you are recruiting in, in Eastern Europe, 
actually try and look at some Eastern European job boards and see how the local companies do it. Because you can often pick up a lot of things that is done slightly different. And by adjusting that, you can get significantly better results. That's really interesting. So, really but interesting. Yeah. Like you said, there's the, the cultural differences are, you know, are still huge. And I think uh, the Western world, sometimes we go a bit over the top and, you know, a bit too politically correct at times. And, um, but yeah, it's finding the right, finding the right balance. Uh, I think a bit is a, is a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. Now my, my favorite topic, Noel, uh, is around delegation. Right. Uh, because I, it's where I see so many people struggle so much. So what kind of tips, trick, delegation secrets do you hide up your sleeve? Um, so the first, I kind of am, um, I am very time poor at the moment, just through a variety of different engagements and, and work that I do. Um, so that helps a lot because it forces me to delegate because otherwise things won't get done. Um, I think successful delegation, and that's, that's really the key. It's actually pretty easy to delegate tasks, but to do them so that they get done in a way that you're happy with and so you get success at the end of it is a lot harder. It's about being clear about what you want and setting those expectations. So you have got to make sure that you're clear on what you're looking for and that you kind of write that down and that you communicate that in a way that works and give the person that you're delegating to, give them the time and the chance to review it and then ask questions. Um, if you've got a really, really simple task, then you know you might just be able to throw it to them and say, do this for me. Um, but even if you know there's there's some really interesting chat on some forums that I'm in about, you know, how can you use a VA to do your travel bookings, for instance? And on one hand, you you know, think that'd be really easy. You say, right, well, I want to fly from London to Bangkok. Um, go out and find me, you know, the best flights you can. But again, there's lots of kind of uh, subconscious biases that we have. There are airlines that we prefer to travel and airlines we don't. There's airports that we want to travel from and, and don't. Um, there's places we prefer to sit near the front, near the back, near the wings, wherever it might be. And so a lot of it, you just have to build up over time and making sure you're clearly communicating. Because when you don't do that, you get frustrated with the, with the result. Yeah. So yeah, It's actually one of the niches where... Like I, I had exactly the same thoughts in the beginning, but when we started with VAs in Philippines, right? And that was definitely one of the niches where we ended up doing, uh, first of all, I ended up doing a SOP for myself and I realized how different people are when it comes to that sort of stuff. And, and yeah. like that was actually something I hadn't considered so much, but, but even the things like when you book yourself and you, you know, like some people just go in book, spend 30 seconds and do it, whereas others spend significant proportion of time getting like the right airports, the right, uh, you know, figuring out and making sure everything is right. Um, so, yeah, but that's, that's a great example of something that, that sounds easy. So simple. Really is yeah. very, very complex, right? Yeah, definitely. So just I think that the art to successful delegation is just being really clear. Um, being really, really clear with what you're after and just giving them that chance to ask questions. You know, they should never, never feel afraid to kind of ask questions about it. And over time, it will, it will improve. Um, and then if you find yourself being frustrated with the output of something, looking back and saying, right, how can we make that better? So looking and continuously improving that. And something we've done with um, content writing and blog articles, for instance, you know, we will start with an idea and then one of the team will go and write that uh, and write that article. And I was frequently finding that I'd get to the end of it when I was reviewing it and I'd be frustrated and going, hang on, this has not taken the direction that I wanted to take. So we've implemented an extra step at the start where we actually do a plan. And it's only about, I don't know, maybe half a page. And it's just where we actually plan out. So from the title to the key headings, um, internal links that we're looking to use, external links, and just that we can flesh out. So actually spending half an hour to an hour planning it up front means that I can review the plan and say, yeah, I'm happy with that. And I know that out of the back when the, the article's done it's going to be actually in the in the kind of the vein that i'm expecting so you know you spend a few minutes planning up front and it saves a lot more time later on in the process yep that's a great one that's a great one okay i think we are nearly at the end no um i would love if you have any kind of management tips tricks apps whatever you really love yourself that you feel 
could be valuable to the audience to know about uh, if you want to share yeah no worries i have one the, the single tip that i give out that is arguably a bit of a controversial one but do not let your team members or your workers remote workers do not let them get bored if that means giving them fake work that is okay you have to as a business owner as an entrepreneur you've got to be mindful that you have limited time or we have limited time um, and so it's important that they've always got some projects that are at lower priority that they can use as time fillers and it sounds a bit weird when I say fake work um, normally you can come up with something that gives you genuine benefit so it might be create a database or a big spreadsheet of our competitors go out and you know what marketing are they doing just something that can take a good amount of time um, and that can be a filler task the reason that that's so important is because if people run out of work they get bored if they get bored they get restless they start looking for other jobs because nobody likes being bored so that's my my single thing and i talk about it all the time um if you're in a situation and, and i've got to be honest almost everyone has situations where they look at it and go oh hell there's not actually you know the queue's a bit light you know for my my team member kind of i need to give them some more things to do but doing that takes a lot of time on your side. So I'm a big fan of always having a couple of projects that they can work on that do give you genuine value, but it doesn't matter if they don't because you're paying them anyway. It's much better to be doing something that has them developing their skills, sitting through a course and learning something. So always make sure that there is more than enough to occupy the hours that, uh, that they're working for you. Love it. I, I use a concept like that I call forever tasks. So yeah. uh, like I, I often suggest people uh, even something that's like lead generation or outreach or, you know, something again that uh, that can uh, you can never have too much, right? Like you can never have too many clients. You can never have too many leads kind of thing. Um, so So stuff that's really can just be done forever. Uh, again, things that ideally have clear goals to them or clear objectives but they aren't, they aren't necessarily business critical. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah, exactly. Love it. Okay, that's excellent. No, if, if people are absolutely ecstatic about this, uh, this podcast and want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to steal some of the time you don't have? <laughs> no worries. I'm, I'm always happy to give time to, uh, to kind of business owners. It's probably the, one of the best bits of the job, really. So um, yeah, just head on over to JobRack, um, jobrack.eu. Uh, or email me directly at noel, which is N-O-E-L at jobrack.eu. And always happy to answer kind of any questions that people have got around kind of hiring or Eastern Europe or, or anything at all, really. If, if, uh, if there's things that uh, your listeners kind of want to uh, kind of want to chat about, then yeah, just by all means, just get in touch. Excellent. Well, I am super privileged that you took the time to spend with me today. And uh, it was awesome having you here. And yeah, if if there's anything anyone have, please get hold of Noel and uh, We'll see you next time. No worries. Thanks a lot, Matt. Awesome to be here. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Please leave a review. It means the world to us. You can also learn more about management at madsingers.com.